Johnny, you know my parents don't want me out this late. You're going to have to take me home soon. Mm, I know, baby. I just wanted to take in this beautiful city. Look at these, these tall skyscrapers and all the lights. Isn't it beautiful, babe? Let's just stay here another few minutes. Well, okay, as long as you promise to take me home real soon. I knew you'd want to. Now why don't you come over here and give me a smooch? No, I really don't think that's such a good idea. Baby, there's someone staring into the window. Hey, who are you? What do you want? Okay, let me just let me just say, I'll put that video on Patreon for you guys. It's us doing half of the story we're doing tonight, the Son of Stan- Sam story. And if you can get through the complete drunkenness, and I'll put a a photo of all the beer that was on the table. It was a disaster. It was a disaster. And and I had to be at work this morning at 7 a.m. Yeah. And not only that, I decided I didn't think I didn't think anything of this at all when we were doing this. But I poured my some of my CBD, which is really strong extract. CBD, like the best FDA approved everything that we get, poured it directly into my drink, which was heavy alcohol, and tell him what happened to me. John (laughs) had like a medical reaction to it. Yeah, I'll put it on. You felt like you were high. Am I high? Yeah. I think I'm high. I was fucking high. And I want to know if anyone else has ever had this reaction before. But so I I took CBD out of the and thing, you took the a scooper, lot. the scooper, or whatever. The dropper. dropper. Yeah, I did about three times as much as I should have done out of the dropper. And then you know how those glass bottles and you got the little squeezer, the eye drop squeezer, yeah. And you can't get at the bottom of it, the ring on the mm-hmm. bottom, because you just can't. Yeah. You know, it's not yeah. fully submerged. That was what happened. So I said, well, there's probably not much left. And so I dumped it into our drink, which was what? Like gin gin and whiskey or something. Who knows? There was a lot of things. And that was after four or five beers. And then I didn't think anything of it until we started. I started reading the Son of Sam letter and I was (laughs) analyzing it. Way more than I should have. We like couldn't get through that damn letter. <laughs> you guys were that so was, drunk, and I'm a... just like, "Whoa, look at this!" Le-. And then I realized I was like, "Wait a minute, I'm high." And I was like, "Did I? Did you guys give me something?" I was really worried. I thought someone gave me something, or what maybe am I going to give you. I, I, we're married. I have no need to drug you. But I looked it up this morning. I was really up there, really up there. So I smoked a lot before in my life, especially in the military and everything. And I've done a lot of other I love drugs. How, like, that's what you say, but that's also <laughs> not like no one would expect that to be <laughs> anyway. Response. So I know what it's like to be really high, and this was exactly what I felt. And you know, like when you when you smoke, you you can kind of tell the level you're going to hit. This just kept going up and up and up and up and up. And I didn't think I was ever going to come down. Anyway, I looked it up and there's a few reasons that could have happened. Number one, it's um, alcohol and CBD mixed together has a thing called the entourage effect, where both of them amplify the effects of each other. CBD is a sedative. And so with and we were drinking a lot, right? We took so much drinks. So either I was extremely sedated, extremely sedated, or the minimal amount of THC in the CBD was amplified by the alcohol. Or there's one other reason that it could have been. So when alcohol and CBD is also a blood thinner. Mm -hmm. So. I could have had hypotension where my, and that's extremely dangerous because that's where your blood is just, you don't have Water. blood pressure. Basically you just, it just, there's nothing, no constriction or whatever. And if that was the case, then that was my medical reaction to that being all high and stuff. But man, it was rough. So we're back <laughs> and we're doing son of Sam. 
<clears throat> yes. And we're very excited. It's like we ha- didn't even hear the first part no, of this. I, I honestly <laughs> recall very minimal. Anyway, we're going to do it again and do it right. Let's do this. So we're going to jump right into it. If you guys want to see that video, it's if you want to try to follow along, I do the half of the Son of Sam story, but we're all extremely intoxicated and I'm on a I'm on the yellow submarine. But you can go to <laughs> Patreon, talkmer.com slash join to get that. And also, I apologize. This episode is going to be out a little late. Since we had to redo it, I'm not going to get to edit it until Tuesday, which means it's going to be out on Thursday. I apologize for any of the listeners. So I apologize for all the listeners who have a set schedule that they listen to this podcast on Tuesday. It's going to be out on Wednesday with the blog post. I apologize. This is going to be one or two parts right now. And next week, I'm going to do more of these episodes of the son of Sam. I'm going to do a really deep dive in this story because it's extremely interesting. Not only that Netflix tomorrow, which is Tuesday, either Tuesday or Wednesday, they're launching a documentary or maybe a mini series called the ultimate evil. And it's a book written by well, he's dead now, but a guy named Maury Terry. And it is the search for the sons of Sam. And we're, I'm, I'm going to cover a little bit of that next week, but the premise of it is more of a conspiracy. Was there more than one son of Sam type of thing? Mm-hmm. We're just simply focusing this story on David Berkowitz in New York, the killings in New York. We're not going to go over if there's any conspiracy or whatever. We're just focusing on the story that happened in New York for for this. So Got it. Yeah, cool. and it's a fascinating story. I thought it would just be a normal serial killer story but i have honestly this is one of the most fascinating stories i have ever researched and we've got 231 episodes out so and a half episode where we're (laughs) freaking completely (laughs) hammered 230.5 so i guess we're going to get right into it and i'm not drinking tonight so this is going to be sober. Um, anyway, my name is John. Welcome to Talk Murder Me. I put all my sources, photos, and videos on talkmurder.com. So go to talkmurder.com. The blog post is The Son of Sam. It should be number 231. That's episode 231. You'll see a full story laid out there. I write those myself. Please share it if you find it interesting. And I put all my photos and stuff like that on that blog post. Also, we are recording this for you guys right now on video at youtube.com and you can just type in talk murder to me and look for episode 231 and that is what we're doing now and this is the son of sam part one and i hope you guys enjoy so this is the son of sam if you guys don't know about the son of sam he it was a killer in the late 70s 76 to 77 they also called him the 44 caliber killer because that was his choice of weapon. He has killed six and injured many more. And it was a hell of a time trying to find this guy. And not only that, but there was a huge panic in New York. And to give the cops a little bit of credit, New York at the time, I believe, nine million people. So to catch one guy going around and killing and his... M.O., as I'll get into, is the lover lane, lover's lane. So if you're making out with your new sweetie in the car, you as soon as you put your arm around her and go in for the kiss, if you don't get slapped, you might get shot. I feel like that was a somewhat common M.O., especially mm. back in the 70s. We don't really, I feel like they don't have. I remember we did, we did at least one lover's lane killer before. Yeah, I think we did. The phantom killer or something like that. Mm-hmm. But this is an extremely interesting story. When I first started researching it, I thought it would just be a regular story. And the premise being this guy, David Berkowitz, was using a big 44 caliber pistol revolver to shoot directly through the windows and kill his victims. And when he got arrested, he blamed it on his neighbor's dog or something like that. That's what everyone kind of realizes. However, that is not even half, not even a quarter of the story. Mm. This story is 
a lot about mental health too. Interesting. And why it's so important <laughs> to be mentally healthy. Yeah. So, yeah. All right, guys. Tonight we are going to April 17th, 1977. It's a Sunday. We hours, we hours in the morning, just like when all of these victims get shot. He does this at night. And who is out after the discos back then closed down at 2 a.m.? You know, who is parking in the car? With the windows fogged. Obviously, some couples making out. Mm -hmm. And that's what he was targeting. Okay. All right. We're starting with the murder of Valentina Suriani and her boyfriend, Alexander Esau. E-S-A-U. He is 20 years old and she is 18 years old. They are a really good looking couple. And if you want to describe for our audience kind of what they look like. She is, uh, well, you already said her age, but young, dark, cropped hair, short hair. Um, He's got like a, uh, like almost like a fro. A feather. It's feathered. It's a what? Feathered, yeah. That's Jen's right. It's like the Farrah Fawcett look. The male Farrah Fawcett version. It looks like a very professional photo. Yeah. Yeah, so you can tell by their body language. I know, Jen, you mentioned that yesterday. The female there, Valentina Sordiani, she is, seems like she's in love with her boyfriend, Alexander, just because their body language, they're kind of leaning into each other. And I guess this is like a prom picture. It's not a prom picture, but you said Professional photo. Yeah. But yeah, so this is the couple here. And this is where we're going to tonight. Her home is right up here. And we're actually going a block away from her house. What, where the the lover's lane was a block away. Exactly. So this is 1873 Hutchinson River Parkway. And if we look at the Google Earth here, you can see that this is about where they were right here. So let's go down and look. Now, things have changed significantly, obviously. But at the time, they were right here. Parked. I believe they were even parked in these trees. It was kind of a an isolated area. These none of these houses were here. I don't believe. You know what's interesting about parkways? Mm. That you drive your car on a parkway and you park your car in a driveway. Interesting. Mm, that is interesting. So right here around this house, as you see the photo right there. At the top right of the Google Earth, you see it's the same exact same photo. And you can see that. You see what I'm talking about? Yeah. This, yeah. So we're about right here. This is the crime scene. And actually, it's to the left of this. They don't actually have the, the crime scene on it. But you can tell this is the same place. Mm. So they were over mm-hmm. here doing what all the other couples do that are, are in love. And even today, they're making out and well actually not even making out from what i read he was a very polite a boyfriend and they haven't hooked up or anything it was it was a puppy love april 17th 1977 it's a sunday the couple leaves valentina's home which is right here in the photo you can see is that uh, the furthest home up there mm-hmm. they leave around 9 p.m telling her parents, that they would be home around 3 a.m. They want to go out, maybe to the discos. Plus, she just got her driver's license, which is a huge thing. Mm. I thought it was kind of old to be getting a driver's license, right? Well, back in the day, I I don't know. It just, it depends. Licenses were younger then. However, if you're in the... New York City area, it is. It may not be as oh, common yeah. for you yeah, to you, get your You don't get a need car. a license, right? You just, yeah, you, you yeah. walk, you take a cab. I had a buddy that, transit. I had a buddy from the UK, and he was 22, 23, never had a license, never needed yeah. one. It's pretty common. Could you imagine not having a driver's license down here, though? God, no. Everything, you can't. Is, everything is so far away. I mean, yeah. I, I technically didn't have a driver's license for a while. Yes, that <laughs> is true. We, we recall. I recall. Uh, that was, oh, wait. That was, yeah, never mind. But we were really proud of you when you took the <laughs> test with the lady. Yeah, I had to take a driving permit test with a lady that was, what, like 22? You had to take a, <laughs> you had to take a permit test and then you had to take the driving test. I'm like 33. <laughs> <laughs> and then I almost hit this dude on a bicycle. <laughs> anyway. Yet they still passed you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyway, 
So they get into her mom's 1968 Mercury Montego, and they're driving around. They actually go to Upper Manhattan. Now, do you all know where that Manhattan is Mm -hmm. from the Bronx? Okay. They turn right onto the Cross Bronx Expressway. They continued east to the Hutchinson River Parkway. And the Hutchinson River, if you guys see here, this is the Hutchinson River Parkway. So it's a pretty big street that runs down here. Mm -hmm. So there were cars passing by, but I mean, they're on this other side of the barrier here. Got it. Yeah. So they drive down there and they get close to her house and they decide to just park and spend some time with each other now one block away from her house which was 1950 hutchinson river parkway where she lived they parked across from where you're seeing now 1873 hutchinson river parkway since we since you guys know we're talking about the son of sam i'm just going to say david berkowitz leaves his apartment which we're going to get into around 8 30 that night so this is in his perspective 8.30 8.30 that night, he's cruising around. He's looking to satisfy the voices in his head. The voices in his head, as we're going to get to in detail, they want one thing, and that is blood. Human mm-hmm. blood. Mm. For this night, specifically, they were talking in a monosyllabic tone of voice, and they were just saying, blood, 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 mm-hmm. blood. And this is from David's own words from his interviews. Okay. That's creepy. Yeah. It's kind of like reminds me of red rum. Yeah. Bad rum. Yeah. 3 a.m. Sunday, almost on the dot, four shots were fired through the Mercury Montego. Now, as I said before, uh, Valentina, the, the female, is actually the driver. And then Alexander is the passenger. Now, this isn't his first kill by any means. We're actually starting towards the later ones. So... And we'll get into his M.O., but he usually goes up to the passenger side because why? The why females you, are usually yeah, there. Yeah, the females are usually on the passenger side. However, it's 3 a.m., it's dark, there's really no illumination at night. You can't really see if it's a woman or man in, you know, which side. You probably you probably know it's both a girl and a boy, right. especially if the windows are kind of foggy and they're out at 3 a.m. Mm-hmm. in a parked car. Yeah, you right. know what I'm saying? You probably... Probably not by yourself. Exactly. So he walks up in a sports jacket, a a very heavy sports jacket, and he pulls a gun from his waistband. And this is his signature gun. It is a 44 caliber Charter Arms Bulldog, which we're going to get into in a second. He lifts the gun up. He points it directly into the passenger side window and he takes a semi squat position. And if you're on YouTube, I'm going to kind of act this out just so you you guys know it. And we're going to talk about the gun, but it's an extremely powerful gun. Okay. You think about like uh, the different calibers, a, a 22, you know, is tiny and then it goes kind of up to like 50 calibers or whatever. So this is a 44 caliber. It's a pretty large slug. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This is a, um, not, it's not um, exactly the, uh, what what's that guy's name? The... Are you feeling lucky, punk, or whatever? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's one of those um, guns. He, he had the Magnum 45, so it's almost the same. But you remember the size of that thing? Dirty Harry? Dirty Harry, yeah. He, he remember the size of that, that pistol. Yeah. It was huge. And this is almost the same size. So he takes a semi-squat position. He takes his left hand, puts it over his right wrist, and that's for recoil effect because if you just shoot it with one hand, you could actually it's break such a your hand. Gun. Yeah. You have to... Yeah, exactly. So he's actually pushing down with his left hand on his right wrist as he holds the gun directly up to the window, probably about less than a foot away from the glass. And another reason he's putting his hand on the his wrist is because if you shoot it without, it's going to recoil up. And he's trying to get all five shots if needed, because this revolver only holds five. He's trying to get all five shots if needed out of the barrel and um, out of the chamber as quickly as possible in rapid succession. And at this point, he's already an expert in killing. He knows exactly where to aim, and that is the head. Aren't you supposed to put, like, put your hand to the bottom, not above? Well, that's for nine mils and stuff like that, would not recoil. If you fire a big forty four like that, I mean, yeah, yeah, you can hold it like that for the recoil, but, 
I mean, he's trying to push it down so he can boom, 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 mm. boom. You know? Interesting. Yeah, it's a pretty big caliber. I'm not going to lie. About the the murder here, two shots each struck both Valentina and Alexander. Okay, so four out of five. Valentina died almost instantly. She was shot in the neck. She died of blood loss, which is what a lot of the victims who get shot with this caliber die of. They die within the minute. There's just too much blood coming out, and that's how they die. Alexander died two hours later after being transported to Jacoby Hospital. Alexander Esau, in the passenger seat, slumped toward the dash- dashboard comatose. Valentina slid slowly backward and was heard moaning. He raised the pistol again to fire a final shot, but suddenly noticed approaching automobile lights. The man was dead. The girl was probably dying. Better not linger, he thought. He fired four shots. He hit Valentina once in the head. She died almost instantly of the blood loss. Yeah. He hit Alexander three times in the head. Wow. Three times in the head. Out of the four shots he he shot. Wow. Exactly. So think about it. He thought that the, the female would be on the passenger side, right? Because that's where usually his killings, you know, that's how right. it happens. They're yep. in the passenger side. So you look at this. Oh, he shot Alexander three times in the head. Well, he's right up to him. You know what I'm saying? He probably doesn't even realize it's not a, a female not one, yeah. until he's almost out of bullets. And then he'll just shoot right over there and try to hit the driver, which in this case was a female. Interesting. So he's shooting. The, that's crazy that he didn't die instantly. I yeah, mean, it's three. crazy because he got shot. Alexander got shot three times in the head yeah. and he died two hours later. That's However... Valentina was shot once in the head and she died within the minute. So, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, but do you want to guess why the shots aren't as powerful when he's shooting them? Is it because he's not using the right size bullet? No, he's using the right size bullet. Oh, I don't know anything about guns, so. He's actually firing through the window. And the window acts as a deflector. Uh. And in fact, a lot of the victims we're going to talk about, because different cars have different windows. And right. some cars, like the your old grandma's Buick, I mean, those windows are, are like her glasses, right? I mean, you freaking, <laughs> I mean, they're huge. So yeah. it's it's interesting to, to note that, especially kind of more expensive cars with bigger glass, there's less damage. Because the, the window is going to take, absorb some of that energy, even though glass is going to fly everywhere mm-hmm. anyway, you know, but mm-hmm. it's still going to do something. But this guy, Alexander, was shot three times in the head, died two hours later. Wow. Now, when the detectives get to the scene, because they already know it's the forty four caliber killer, it took them a while to to come to the realization that it was a serial killer. And the reason they did that was obviously the 44 calibers. It's an extremely rare gun. Okay. And I got the numbers here in a second, but, uh, well, let me sh- tell you right now, only 28,000 have ever been made. Wow. And out of those numbers, 667 were reported stolen or lost. Huh. So 28,000 guns were made. Wow. Compared to like a nine mil, a regular or a Smith and Wesson revolver, or whatever, which has millions in production. Right. You know, this is a very a, a niche gun. So when the detectives get to the scene and they get there pretty quick, because actually the detectives and Thousands of law enforcement from all over have been doing stakeouts. And in fact, this murder in particular was three blocks away from the first murder that happened. And just like with all all of these stories, they'll get the call and what is called a code four four. They had a special code for uh. it. So code 44 comes in, and then whoever's in the car, police or whatever, they say, damn, I was, we were just there five minutes ago. I didn't see anyone. So they rush back there, and it's already been taken place. Like, they could never just catch this guy. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, they get there, and they have a task force, the Omega Task Force. One of the police officers finds a letter 
in an envelope that is directly on the ground. And it's kind of weird. And he was like, well, what is this? And he picked it up. Now, they couldn't get fingerprints of David's because it was compromised by a lot of other detectives. They didn't wear gloves. They're just like, oh, let me see this. Got my name on it type of thing. But we're going to read the letter tonight. I'm going to put it on talkmer.com with all these other photos. Okay, so the book we're reading tonight, as I'll get into, is called The Son of Sam. It's the definitive guide to this killer. The uh, The author, which I'll talk about, was given complete access by the mayor of New York for any police files or any evidence that he needed to write the story. Huh. So it is the definitive book, and if you want to know everything about the story, this is the only one to read. Anyway, this is the letter right here, and I'm going to go ahead and read it. I got it uh, printed out, so it's going to be a lot easier to read it. It is a four-page letter. It was addressed to the captain of the Omega Task Force. His name was Captain Joseph Borelli. So on the envelope, it said, Dear Captain Joseph Borelli. So obviously that means David Berkowitz, the son of Sam, has been watching the news and has been reading the newspaper. Hmm. And this is one of those stories where the killer talks to the news, the news talks to the killer, even some cer- some certain journalist they're talking back and forth, hmm. and he's talking by these letters. So I'm going to go ahead and read this. This is a four-page letter. Okay. And this is where we stopped yesterday, guys. <laughs> wow. <laughs> We're flying through in comparison. <laughs> and the, the, this is right when I knew that I was not right. Something was wrong, because I was reading this letter. I'm like, whoa, this is trippy. I was like, whoa, wait, hold on. <laughs> Why am I high? <laughs> What the fuck? My high. I said that all I last think, night. I was trying to. I think I'm high. Because, I, yeah, I was trying to get you guys to believe me. We believed you. I know, but I didn't believe myself. I was <laughs> like, how? How is this possible? So this letter was the one that they found at the scene. At the scene, yeah. Okay. And that's why I'm starting with this story as compared to the other ones because this is not the first murder. It's not the last, but. I'm starting here because, as you'll see, this is where he brands himself. And in in, I mentioned this yesterday a little bit. It's interesting because in New York is if you watch Mad Men, Madison Avenue, especially during this time period, the early 70s or whatever. It's all about marketing Mm -hmm. and branding. So David Berkowitz actually branded himself for the media. You know, and it's it's really interesting that he did that. He's he's probably a brilliant marketer when it comes to that stuff. Anyway, this is what the letter says. I'm going to read it kind of suspensefully. Okay. Dear Captain Joseph Borelli, I am deeply hurt by you calling me a women hater. And women is spelled W-E-M-O-N. I am not, but I am a monster. Now, let me stop for a second. I'm not high, but... Why would why would he immediately come out and say he's not a women hater? Well, why do people think he's a women hater? Because he kills a woman first. Exactly. Yeah. So the media, no, it wasn't the police. It was the media saying, "Oh, this guy maybe has was sexually abused by his mother, or maybe his girlfriend broke up with him, or you know, his wife divorced him, or whatever." So he immediately starts out by saying that, which kind of means. That really bugs him. And the fact that he misspells w- women to women, you know. It's weird. Yeah. yeah. But I am not a monster. I am the son of Sam. And so obviously when the, the media got this letter, now the headlines, son of Sam, which is a, a brandable name. Yeah. Yeah. You know, very. The monikers. <laughs> then it goes on and says. <laughs> Sounds like I wish I thought of that. <laughs> I am a little brat. In quotations. Hmm. When Father Sam gets drunk, he gets mean. He beats his family. Sometimes he ties me up to the back of the house. Other time he locks me in the garage. Sam loves to drink blood. So as we talked about earlier, sorry I'm interrupting again, but who was talking in his head to go kill tonight. Blood, blood, blood. Mm -hmm. So Sam loves to drink blood. Quote, go out and kill, end quote, commands Father Sam. Behind our house, some rest, mostly young, raped, and slaughtered. Their blood drained, just bones now. Papa Sam keeps me locked in the attic, too. 
I can't get out, but I look out the attic window and watch the world go by. I feel like an outsider. I am on a different wavelength than everybody else programmed to kill. It's interesting. Sorry to cut you off, but it's funny when you were talking about last night, you were analyzing the letter. Now that we know, I mean, <laughs> no. you were on a different wavelength last night, <laughs> but like we know that he, we know that there's a lot of, a lot of discussion about mental health in this case. And when you think about when, can you go back real quick? When he, when he says, Papa Sam keeps me locked in the attic, too. I can't get out, but I look out the attic window and watch the world go by. That's like he's talking about his head. Mm. Papa Sam is, right? He's the voice. He's the voices, right? Mm-hmm. And um, like uh, keeps me locked in the attic, his brain, mm-hmm. and he's looking out the window, his eyes at the world going by. That's how I interpreted it. That's a really good interpretation. But I'm telling you. And that's what most people would think. But the reason the story is so fascinating is because that is not what it means once we figure out who this guy was. It's a really good. No, it is deep, but it gets the real reason is a lot deeper. We got to talk about who Sam is and what he's talking about looking out the attic at the window, out the window, because he's I, I i'll get into it <sighs> i know okay. it's crazy it's, it's this is crazy anyway okay here i am thinking i cracked it i was like oh i get it it's like a Nailed mental it. Uh, <laughs> and this is me Wrong. Hi, <laughs> me hi the yesterday <laughs> oh man did you you see that wow <laughs> so fucking stoned am i high <laughs> i think i'm high <laughs> the uh the letter goes on however to stop me you must kill me Attention all police. Shoot me first. Shoot to kill or else keep out of my way or you will die. So he's asking the police right now to kill him. Mm. (laughs) You know, I I just want to say real quick. I'm sorry to interject again. If David Berkowitz was never caught, this would be a, a, a case like the Zodiac. Yeah. You know, it'd be like, who who wrote this? It's so weird, you know? Yeah. It's yeah. kind of like who wrote the Ramsey letter? Because we all know that uh, the dad didn't write it. <laughs> it, it, was, was, it was the mom. <laughs> well, the mom, it was the mom. It was Patsy's <laughs> handwriting. I mean, we all know it was Burke, so. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. I mean, it's not fine because we don't know, but we know. Papa Sam is old now. He needs some blood to preserve his youth. And I'm going to get to this in a second, and this isn't part of the letter, but how old do you think Papa Sam is? As old as David Berkowitz? He is 6,000 years old. Oh. (laughs) That's like biblical. That was a trick question. Yeah, I know. I just see like this old man with a long beard (laughs) with a stick that beats him. He, Papa Sam is old now. He needs some blood to preserve his youth. He has had too many heart attacks. And this is where we got stuck. Oh, yeah. It says, quote, ugh, me hoot. It hurts, sonny boy. It hurts. Yeah. That's what's, yeah. It hurts. (laughs) I miss my pretty princess most of all. Remember that, pretty princess. That is extremely important. Okay. To the psychology. She's resting in our lady's house, but I'll see her soon. I am the monster, Beelzebub, the chubby behemoth. And obviously you guys have, you see what, this, you know the son of Sam, right? He's, have you seen a photo of him yet? I think I I'll have. I'll have to show him to you, but he's chubby. Yeah. You know, not, he's got the chubby face. Yeah. yeah. So the Dark chubby. Hair. Yeah. I love to hunt, prowling the streets, looking for fair game. Tasty meat. The women, and he spelled women wrong, of queens. That's important. Why, why would he put queens in there? The, I, I feel like the police should have been like, well, maybe this guy lives in Queens. <laughs> well, I mean, because he's killing in the Bronx, right? Or yeah. is he going to he's all kill- different boroughs? Different boroughs. And in the on the last victim, he actually crossed over to Brooklyn. Okay. Which apparently you don't do that because they were really pissed about that. I'm sure everyone was pissed. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) 
The women of Queens are prettiest of all. I must be the water they drink. I live for the hunt. My life, blood for Papa. Mr. Borelli, sir. This is the captain. I don't want to kill anymore. No, sir. No, but I must. Honor thy father. I want to make love to the world. I love people. I don't belong on earth. Return me to yahoos. To the people of Queens, I love you. And I, and it's supposed to be I'm, but the letter M is crossed out. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. I'm, oh. yeah. I want to wish all of you a happy Easter. May God bless you in this life and in the next. And for now, I say goodbye and good night. Remind me of a uh, good night, San Diego, or whatever what was it. You stay classy, San Diego. <laughs> Police, let me haunt you with these words. I was I know you want to do it. You want to do the I'll be back. Yes. <laughs> I'll be back. I'll be back. I'll be back. To be interpreted as bang, bang, bank. Bang, dash, ugh. Yours in murder, Mr. Monster. So what do you guys think of that? Pretty crazy, eh? Yeah. When did um the Terminator come out? Was that after? <laughs> um, I'm serious. Like, was no, that's he ref- a really was good question. I this? think the Terminator was 80s. I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure it was I 80s. I think it was. But I'm not... Actually, let me look yeah, it up. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It is the 80s. I, mean, um, I, I doubt... Well, maybe. Maybe it was a, like a subconscious thing. Because this letter was extremely popular, obviously. Hmm. Everyone in the world was talking about Son of Sam after this. So maybe the creator of Terminator... Because this is 78. Maybe a, maybe yeah. Maybe the Terminator yeah. creator had that in his mind type of thing. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, that, that is, is fascinating. That is a bizarro letter. Yeah, and like I said, if he was never caught, then that would be we'd be studying that thing today. So anyway, let's move on. All right. So who you're looking at now is the sketch. This is the Omega Task Force presenting a press conference at the time. Uh, Isn't that very different from what, oh, than yeah. what he looks like? Oh, yeah. There's a ton of sketches, and none of them come close. Huh. In fact, in the book that uh, that you're going to be reading a little bit of, the uh, the author talks about how the police, n- none of the police give any credence to these sketch artists, you know? I mean, it helps sometimes, but the problem is now people are only looking for this guy, and if it's not even close, then, you know, you're, you're actually hurting the investigating mm-hmm. the investigation, you know what I'm saying? More than you're helping it. Going back to the uh, Alexander and Valentina murder, I want to say real quick, when David runs away from the car, because he only shot, as you, as you read, he said, quote, the girl, and this is his quotes, you know, the girl was probably dying. You know, mm-hmm. that's what he said. So, and he thought the man was dead for sure. Yeah, exactly. So how does he know? Because he knows for sure that the girl ended up dying. And how do you think he would? I'm not going to. You're not going to get it. I'm just going to tell you the way he knows that because he's got to get out of there. These cops are going to be there in five minutes and he's parked right down the street. So he knows when he's running back to his car that he succeeded in his mission because the demons, from what he claims, in his head are quiet. Finally, he gets some peace in his head. Even though the peace doesn't last long, at least he can sleep tonight because they're not bothering him. Okay, I just wanted to tell you that. Okay. Got it. This right here, what you're looking at, is the Charter Arms 44 caliber revolver. And this is a very recognizable gun and you can't really see what it looks like here but this is the uh the exact gun so if you want to describe that number one tell tell me how many bullets are laying beside it five so it's a five shooter yes. which is which is odd you know most revolvers are six they got six slots in the chamber this is a a stubby pistol it's real fat and i think it looks beautiful actually i this is like what i would probably 
use like for home defense and and well in fact this is a home defense weapon this is not you don't kill wild game with this thing you kill people with this thing there's no other reason for it. it's a home defense someone breaks in you this is what you shoot them with hmm. but i'm going to talk a little bit about the charter arms now the, this is the charter arms bulldog his was actually a 1974 model and he got the weapon from his friend his old army friend, because David Berkowitz was in the army, which we'll get to. And he brought, he bought it down in Texas because in New York, you can't hardly buy any guns. They have the strictest laws, even though he went back to New York and bought all kinds of rifles, Hmm. even one called the deer, the deer slayer. (laughs) It's like, what the fuck? (laughs) It's like that. What that one episode we did, the the incinerator. Mm. Yeah. Is that what it was called? Yeah. With uh, Dellen, my lord. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, this is a people gun, not a sporting gun. The Charter Arms is a company in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Only 28,000 of these were made. Out of those 667, which I feel like it was 666, but they just upped it. So it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it, would be, it would be fitting with this story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 667 were reported lost or stolen. Now, this is from charterfirearms.com. They still are a company. I do not think they make the Bulldog anymore. You can still buy these, and a lot of people, gun collectors, will try to recreate the Son of Sam gun. And there's a video I put on Talk Murder to this guy. She's a hobbyist. He gets the, the correct stock, the correct handles, Everything he even like trims the trigger just to look like exactly like the one that the son of Sam was using. The from charterfirearms.com it says, quote, the bulldog is a powerful but compact revolver. The bulldog is ideal for concealed carry and target practice. It's ergonomic. Well, that's the word they use today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like your chair. It's ergonomic. Finger grooved rubber grip minimizes recoil for maximum comfort and control. While when now is a bit so there's a lot of recoil. It's not minimizing it that much. While the potent 44 special chambering delivers almost twice as much muzzle energy on target as the less powerful 38 special. So they're competing with the Smith and Wesson's 38 special. David Berkowitz also purchased a variety of other weapons. However, when and when he was doing his first kill, he was thinking about which one to bring. And he just by happenstance decided to bring the 44, which, you know, to his delight, branded him as the 44 killer and then the son of Sam. So that became his thing. So now he's not going to bring a rifle because he wants the public attention. Mm, right. You he know. wants them to be tied. To yeah. Him. He doesn't want to shoot someone a rifle. And be like, well, that's not him. It's not a forty-four caliber. Yeah. He also purchased other rifles to shoot, as we'll get into, demon dogs. Kind of like the one we got in the sunroom. <laughs> I got stop. <laughs> he shoots demon dogs. We got three of them actually, in this house. Does he actually shoot yeah, dogs? Yeah, he shoots dogs. <gasps> he kills one in the story. He puts a bullet in the other one. But the bullet it was stuck there for the rest of his life. He survived. And mm. one of them he tried to, to uh, blow up with a Molotov cocktail. Oh, my God. Yeah, he's got some problems. But he also buys a Charter Arms AR-7 Explorer a rifle, a Commando Mark III rifle, and a 12-gauge Deer Slayer and a, a, a Glenfield rifle. So he's got a whole arsenal. However, he only uses that one. In fact, it's weird because... As you'll see as he continues to murder people, he's actually conserving his ammunition because the 44... You can't go buy this. You can't go buy 44 caliber mm-hmm. bullets. It, they just don't make enough of them. It's, it's such a weird caliber. You know what I'm saying? So he's actually conserving his ammo, which is why he's shooting in the head and, and really trying to hit the head type of thing. So this is the son of Sam David Berkowitz. Very chubby face. And what do you notice about this photo? This is a black and white photo. He's obviously arrested. He's Happy. arms... He's smiling. Yeah. He's smiling. In fact, when they arrested him, they didn't think he was the right guy. Because he looks nothing like the sketches. But he, he acted like a 12-year-old kid. Smiling and everything else. Not not really all there. Honestly, he would have been 
completely let out the hook if he didn't admit to all these killings because they they honestly didn't have any real evidence that he did it. Mm. And I'll get to that. But he is smiling there. And when he is arrested, he says, hey, I'm Sam. You know, I'm Dave. I'm David Burke. I'm the son of Sam type of thing. And he's smiling like with a smile on his face It's very childlike. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And this is him. He's always smiling. He's always smiling. And right quick, we're reading from the son of Sam based on the authorized transcription of the tapes, official documents and diaries of David Berkowitz. Now, this is by Lawrence Day Klausner. Like I said earlier, he was actually given complete access to all the police files and everything else to write this story by the mayor of the city. Mm. The mayor wanted the correct story to be put out. And he entrusted this guy to do it. That's never happened before. Mm. You know, usually writers, the true crime writers, they have to kind of buddy buddy up to the police and they might get, you know, a nugget here, a nugget there. And the really good writers like Ann Rule, they're really, really respected within the law enforcement. So they get even more. And you can tell. But this guy has access to everything. Everybody that was on the case, every every document he needed. So it's, it's a really definitive good book. It's really good. It's almost like Capote, how he yeah. was mm. he he was like t- talking to the the guy in this in the cell and put out that story. Mm. So guys, for this story, the son of Sam, I, I I'm going to expand on this and guys stick with me, listeners out there. I'm going to put you through hell with this story, but I want to I want to get everything down pat and for. Our Patreon, we're actually going to be doing a special story for you guys. I'm not going to cover in the on iTunes, but it's based on David Berkowitz. And and that's coming from a, a book written by uh, Roxanne Tariello. She was a talk show host. And this book is called Change Can Happen for You, From Son of Sam to Son of Hope. Huh. So David Berkowitz is still alive. Really? He's serving six life sentences, but he has transformed into a devout Christian, and apparently he is completely changed. Interesting. And he hates the moniker Son of Sam, and he likes to be called, well, I don't know if he likes to be called Son of Hope or not, but this is a a religious book. Obviously, it's it's pushing a, a religious agenda, not in a bad way, but... I mean, just by the the nature of it, it's a, a Christian woman saying that even David Berkowitz, the son of Sam, can can uh, find hope. Hmm. Um, so we're going to be doing that one for you Patreon people this month. I'm also going to do another story for you guys, too. I'm, I'm trying to do two a month. The next one that we're going to do next week for everyone is something that just came out, just came out two weeks ago. And this is about the conspiracy a uh, part of the conspiracy, I believe. It's called The Son of Sam and Me. Huh. Oh. The Son of Sam and Me. The truth about why I wasn't shot by David Berkowitz. Oh. Uh, by Carl De Niro. And he was one of the victims, if you will. He wasn't shot, but with Brian Whitney. So we're going to be talking about that. We're going to go over that, too. Huh. Like I said, this is a fascinating case, and I just can't just... Yeah. So we're going to do another episode based on that book, too? Yeah, so, uh, sorry to regress again, but The Ultimate Evil is coming out this week, and it's conspiracy-based. There's a huge conspiracy on this, and I want to cover mostly David Berkowitz, but I do want to hint on the conspiracy aspect, too, because you guys are going to watch the Netflix thing, and, you know... Not until you tell us we can. Right. Well, I'm just saying... You know, anyway. So, anyway, look forward to that. Jen's like, I won't make that uh, mistake again. Nope. I still haven't watched the Anaconda thing. What Anaconda thing? The Serpent. Oh, oh. No one's wanting me to do that story. What the I hell? It's like one of my favorite stories, and maybe I didn't cover it right. I don't know. The book was also like 600 fucking pages, so I'm not like too excited about revisiting that story. <laughs> So, all right, let's talk about David's background. Tell me about his background. Take a guess. Was he abused or or what? I'm going to say yes. Was he Jewish? Yeah, he was Jewish. Well, obviously, Berkowitz. Uh, you were supposed to know that. 
Berkowitz well, is it actually doesn't have to be. Actually, Berkowitz isn't his real name, so you shouldn't have known that. But Berkowitz is a Jewish name, isn't it? Yeah. Well, like it, like it traditionally, it, it doesn't have to be Jewish though. It could be like Polish. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So in Queens, where David grew up, or yeah, in Queens where David grew up. And I've never been, but especially in the 70s, it's like a culture pot there. There's a lot of mosques there now, mm -hmm. from what I've seen on Google Earth, and the a lot of Hasidic Jews there as well. So, and a lot of Italians, you know, mm -hmm. stinking up the place. <laughs> Shit, I'm just kidding. All right, we're going to where David Berkowitz was born. This is 555 Prospect Place. It is a... Blank Hospital, Jewish Hospital, very good. I don't know if it's still a Jewish hospital, but this is where he was born. Hmm. And for you people on YouTube and podcasts, we're actually going through and looking at the Google Earth now, so be sure to go there. This is a, a photo of David when he was a youngin. David Berkowitz, born Richard David Falco, hmm. F-A-L-C-O. His mother, Betty, was abandoned suddenly by her Italian-American husband, Anthony Falco. And why do you think she, why do you think he left him, left her? Because she got pregnant. And he was like, well, this ain't going to work if you're pregnant, even though it's his kid. <laughs> like, what the fuck? Sounds like a nice guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. David's mother, Betty, so his actual mother, okay, and not his father. He's got a different father. Keep that in mind. Okay. Okay. So, but his mother was married to an Italian husband, Anthony Falco. Okay. They split up way before Davis was born. Okay. Years before he was born. The mother, Betty, was from Poland and Austria. So that's his biological mother. He's got Polish and Austrian in him. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Her husband, Tony, was from Italy, obviously, but that's not his biological father. Am I, am I confusing you all? No, just keep going. Betty was also Jewish. Austria and Poland, she's Jewish. Okay, mm -hmm. so David Berkowitz, born Falco, is Jewish. Okay. He was bar mitzvahed and everything. David's sister, Rosalind Falco, which he never really met because mm -hmm. this was way before he came along. Rosalind Falco was born November 14th, 1939. The husband, which is not David's biological father, left within a year after she was Rosalind was born. Okay. For another woman who, from the book, says, quote, wasn't pregnant, end quote. Okay. The mother, Betty, David's mother, owned Falco's Fish Market, but okay. that went bust pretty quick. Then she goes through her divorce and goes through... Eight years of what she calls, quote, eight years of loneliness, end quote. Hmm. She met a man named Joseph Kleinman, a Long Island businessman with three of his own kids. Mm -hmm. She got pregnant with David Berkowitz, you know, mm -hmm. with right. what would be David Berkowitz okay. by this guy, Joseph Kleinman, his actual father, a Long Island businessman. She got pregnant and he didn't like that. So he left. OK, he said to her. Quote, this is an actual quote. Look, you're pregnant, not me. I want to keep seeing you, but I'll be damned if I ever pay a cent for the child support. Mm -hmm. End quote. She protested saying, well, it is your kid inside of me. Yes. He says, quote, if you want to keep seeing me, you'll give the kid away. End quote. Huh. David was fostered out. So wow. David didn't know his he didn't know he was adopted until he was eight wow. years old. But luckily, he was put in the care of a very loving family. However, there were some, some tragic happenings within that family that caused them to break up, which I'm going to go over now. Now, I want to talk a little bit about this study that I'm seeing from, uh, what is this, uh, some college, Radford University Department of Psychology in Radford, Virginia. Now, the reason I'm saying I'm sort of kind of going through this is because I didn't actually see that any of this in the book, but I thought it was interesting. And that is the fact that in 1960, when David was seven years old, he was hit by a car and suffered Ooh. head injuries. 
And the reason mm. I'm bringing that up is because a lot of serial killers have head injuries mm-hmm. when they're young. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Jen. Or concussions. <laughs> a lot, a literally a, a way skewed amount of killers we've covered yes. have had traumatic head injuries when they were kids. Mm-hmm. Like, there's something going on there. Okay. For sure. For sure. Okay, go watch Concussion, that movie with Will Smith. I still haven't seen that movie. It's good. Okay, so he was hit by a car, suffered head injuries. A few months later, he ran into a wall and suffered another head injury. He also, at the age of eight, was hit in the head with a pipe. Whoa. And received a four-inch gash in the forehead. And he also, this is about the time he begins to masturbate, which was coincidentally right after he saw a little girl being killed by a car in a car accident. Oh, boy. In front of his eyes. So that information is from the uh, psychology department at Radford. Interesting. I didn't see that in the book, but maybe they just didn't think to mention it. Anyway. It's an interesting tidbit, though. Yeah. David was adopted, and he, as a child, claims that he saw monsters until 13. Hmm. I've never seen, like, when I was a kid, like, I I know we watched movies where they have an imaginary friend or whatever. Maybe Mm -hmm. it's because I had a brother. I never had an imaginary friend. I never saw monsters. Did Mm y'all? Okay, he actually saw monsters. And, in fact, is extremely interesting because these same monsters leave when he's 13. But then they come back as the demons. Oh, it's the same monsters turn into the demons when he's older. Interesting. And he he claims it's the same demons. Interesting. Okay. Okay. At 10 years old, he was bitten. By a dog? By a German shepherd. You know, because there's. Interesting. All over the place, right? They are great dogs, okay? (laughs) Uh, Murphy is the sweetest dog. Yeah, he tries to hunt my little puppy. That didn't happen. All right, this is where he went to high school. High school one, two, three. That's hmm. the name of the high school. Wow. <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> uh, okay, and and let's talk about his uh, adoptive parents. Is there, is there still a school there today? Yeah, it, it actually is a school. It's not high school one, two, three, though, that's there today. It's another different school. That's a good question. High school one, two, three moved down the road. But so it is, is it four, a four, five, six now. <laughs> <laughs> they do weird things in New York, man. I don't know. So David was sent to live with adoptive parents. He was sent to a foster his adoptive mother, Pearl Berkowitz and Nat Berkowitz, extremely caring, loving couple mm-hmm. that dedicated their life to raising David. One of the reasons he was picked on as a child is because he was like the only kid in class without a sister or brother. Even though he has a biological one, he didn't know it. Right. But so they were just focused on raising him and Mm -hmm. they sent him to the best of everything. Okay. However, things went downhill when Pearl Berkowitz died of breast cancer on October 5th, 1967. Oh, no. That left Nat, his adoptive father, Mm -hmm. in dire straits. And at the funeral, one acquaintance of David Berkowitz says, quote, he cried really hard at the funeral. I mean, he was really crying, end quote. Mm-hmm. He was uh, he was destroyed that his his adoptive mother, Pearl, died of, oh, yeah. of breast cancer. Yeah. After her death, his grades plummeted. Now, he'll say he was an A student. Here's the thing about the psychology of David Berkowitz. He thinks of himself as better than he is. He wasn't an A plus student. He was a low B student, but he claimed, cause there's extensive interviews that he's given. And he says, when Pearl died, uh, my grades went from A plus to, to down to C's and D's, you know, in reality they were B's and now, I mean, they did go down, but mm-hmm. yeah, okay, sorry. He's making himself out better than he was. Yeah, exactly. After the adoptive mother died, they moved here. 170 dressier loop. Mm-hmm. So this, as you can see right now, is a a big apartment building. Mm-hmm. And the mother is dead, so they move here. Now, one thing about David Berkowitz, even when he's committing these killings, he is very nostalgic. He always goes by the apartment. He always visit revisits his childhood. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
And this is the apartment right here He's he was living in. Mm-hmm. At 13, the monsters leave that he sees. And at 14, Pearl dies. So he is just now getting rid of these monsters. They're finally gone from out of his closet. And he has peace for the first time in his life. And then Pearl dies. Mm. So the monsters are, are gone. Now Pearl dies. They come back. So in his head, he is associating... Oh, I know why they left. They left to kill my mother mm -hmm. to give her breast cancer. And now that she's dead, guess what? They're back. But now they're demons. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Like to, to a, a mentally deranged person like David Berkowitz, because he wasn't just lying about demon dogs and everything else. He was living it. This dude is, he has some mental issues that were never solved until he was in prison. Got it. Very bad complicated mental issues right extremely like would have been released vince lee type of yeah issues you know if if it wasn't such a public outrage to to have him be released he would have been released interesting yeah okay. oh yeah he always thought that there was a quote force end quote that kept people away from him after uh, Pearl died. They move into what you see now, 17B70, 170 Dressier Loop. And then suddenly in December of 1975, mm -hmm. the father's store, his uh, convenience store, was robbed at, at gunpoint. Oh. And oh, so he just lost his wife. Now he almost li lost his own life. And he decides to just move. And he goes to Florida. He sells a store and he books it to Florida. But he leaves David there. With New York. Well, David's 18 now. Oh, oh, yeah. Wow. But like I said, that was his last his last support string. The father, they, they knew he was growing up with these mental issues and stuff like that. So just to leave him. But the father is so distraught over his wife suddenly dying because she had beat breast cancer once. But then it just came back. Boom. Killed her quickly. Mm. So he just completely moves down there. David is now all by himself in an apartment in New York, and he is completely antisocial and in his own head. This is a letter a little bit before the killings of that David has written to his father. And this is before the killings. Dear Dad, it's cold and gloomy here in New York, but that's okay because the weather fits my mood gloomy. Dad, the world is getting dark now. I can feel it more and more. The people, they are developing a hatred for me. You wouldn't believe how much some people hate me. Many of them want to kill me. I don't even know these people, but they still hate me. Most of them are young. I walk down the street and they spit and kick at me. The girls call me ugly and they bother me the most. The guys just laugh. Anyhow, things will soon change for the better. Very ominous. Because yeah. after he writes this, he basically goes on the killing rampage. Right. Okay. That lasted about a year. All right. So David actually enrolled in the army and he did his training at Fort Dix. This is a photo of him up here. Hmm. He looks pretty normal. Yeah. Yeah. I would think, you know, at least. Where is Fort Dix? Is that in New York? New Jersey. Jersey. New Jersey. Yeah. Okay. So he attends Bronx Community College, but he didn't do very well. So he enlisted in the U.S. Army. From June 23rd, 1971 to June 24th, 1974, which is three years. He qualified as a sharpshooter with the M16 rifle and mm. basic training, which is what I <laughs> am, sharpshooter. So you, the, I'm not sure making that connection, <laughs> though, sounded positive. <laughs> okay, You're so, like, I'm also the same as David Berger. I am. So a sharpshooter is, if I remember correctly, there's 40 targets that you got to hit between, like, 50 yards and 300 yards with an M16 rifle. There's 40 and they pop up last and there's little silhouettes, mm -hmm. tiny silhouettes. They come, they're, they're all these little hills and then a silhouette pops up yeah. 50 yards away and you got to shoot it or whatever. 100 yards away, you got to shoot it. And so you have to get all of them to be considered? If you get uh, all of them, 40 out of 40, you're a Hawkeye. Oh. However, the sharpshooter is 36 out of 40. Mm -hmm. So he got at least 36 or like me, 38 Oh. Out of 40. Oh. <laughs> and now he's a sharpshooter. So there's not many Hawkeyes that uh, came out there. 
But uh, that's, that's really actually really hard to do because I mean they I believe you, it. You know, one pops up over here to your right, it's and like then whack them all. But it, yeah. it only lasts for three seconds, so you gotta you gotta actually readjust. And there's no like in the movies where you see the dot over the thing. These are iron sights, so it's just like you know, mm-hmm. it, it's actually pretty uh, intense to do. He actually served in Fort Knox, guarding uh, ah. all Nicole's gold. Yep, <laughs> and. All South Korea. Wow. He was okay. actually at the DMZ. Whoa. Yeah, he was uh, at I the would, DMZ. That would be like fascinating to yeah. see. I would actually love to go see the DMZ. What? Just this is like, like literally just a line. Take a walk. <laughs> and a wall. <laughs> I'm in North Korea. Now I'm in South Korea. Now I'm in North Korea. Now I'm in South Korea. Isn't that what Trump, Trump did? It was like, oh. Stone. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, oh, I'm here. <laughs> and his aides are like, no, don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> So let me talk a little bit about his army uh, life, because it's kind of crazy. He didn't fit in with the hippie crowd that was going on at the time, which is why he says he joined the army. I think it was just because he couldn't do college and he had nothing else to do to do. David Berkowitz says, quote, I sort of lived like behind the times. I wanted to see some action, prove something to myself. It was rebellion then against parents, country and stuff. Kids were and hippies. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, he's very childish, as you can see. Kids were hippies and into drugs. I guess then I was very patriotic, which uh, he did want to be a fireman and policeman, but, you know, I think he, he bolsters himself. Anyway, nobody else except a couple people here were, in quote. He was deployed with the infantry to South Korea, stationed in the DMZ over the, in, was it Incon River? Icon River? I don't know. He was actually demoted once for going AWOL. Ooh. You know. He claims that during his stay in South Korea, his buddies and him were in heavy drugs like heroin, acid, and mescaline. And CBD is mixed it, with heavy alcohol. Isn't mescaline <laughs> lettuce? Mescaline is a type of lettuce. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. Yes, it is. I know this because when I go to Verde, <laughs> it's mescaline that I order. <laughs> Well, did I write that wrong? <laughs> I think I think you wrote something in it uh, out of corrected it to masculine. People are like he ate he's a lot e- of lettuce. He's eating some leafy greens. <laughs> can, we, can we fact check this? What is masculine? I know masculine is lettuce. This fucking computer, man. This computer just changes shit. Yeah, it's mes- masculine is on purpose. Le- leafy greens. It's a spring mix. <laughs> David Berkowitz claims that while he was in Korea, he partook in all these drugs, but. No one believed him. Mm. He also said he was having sex with a lot of Korean prostitutes. Experts to this day believe he's still a virgin. Interesting. You know, which is not a bad thing, but he... It's interesting that he's saying, though, that he's... There you go. So it's part of his psychology. He's He's bolstering himself up. He is fabricating a lot of things. Yeah. But it's it's more out of a a sense of insecurity. Mm -hmm. He wants to fit in. And that's why it's... it's like a 12 year old kid. That's what I'm trying to say. When they caught yeah. him, they were like, what the fuck? Do like, you, you really do this? He's like bragging like a 12 year old would. I had sex with a lot of women over there. Experts still believe he's a virgin, even to this day, he's still alive. But he said there was a Korean prostitute named Miss Chet, and she was an older lady. And his friends were making fun of him because, you know, she's like 65, 70, being real nice to David. He, She did give him something um, that. That lasted a while, though. Chlamydia? (laughs) Gonorrhea. (laughs) But this is how you... Wait, so did... So was he... You can get gonorrhea from doing handsy stuff. (laughs) John's like, I know, because I was also in the army, (laughs) just like David (laughs) Berkowitz. But you could also get crabs from, like, the toilet seats. Oh, God, that's just what people that... People say that shit. It's true, they jump. Okay, this is how we know that he's still a virgin. He claims once with Miss Chet, he even, quote, achieved penetration, end quote. But that's how you have you seen the 40 year old virgin? It feels like a a lamp. And it's like, wait, you never had sex before. (laughs) Boobs feel like a lamp. That's the same kind of shit. Like you you would say, oh, I achieved penetration. No one's going to be like, yo, I just achieved penetration, dude. What's up? Like, what? <laughs> you achieve penetration? What the fuck? <sighs> Basically, here's the story. He works at a place called IBI. It is a 
security company. He works for this loading dock security company. He also works as a taxi driver, which helps him out knowing the streets. But he only works there for a month. He's also, when he was caught killing, when he finally got caught, he was employed by the United States Postal Service. Yeah, he was a post worker. Wow. So Newman. <laughs> Newman. <laughs> Newman. <laughs> that was the greatest show. Kramer fucking ruined it. His racist ass. Yeah, that All was right. pretty bad. He even works as an AC installer for a company called Wolf and Moonier. It's like a law firm or something like that. And once a co-worker there, Jack Villietto says about David, quote, he was quiet and a loner. He was just a body and a plant, not much of a worker. He didn't do good with tools. He was just sometimes depressed and would break out into tears, end quote. So there's a little bit about his education and employment history. I have a whole tab on his psychosis, which we're probably not going to get to today. In this episode, there's a lot to it. But anyway, here's what goes on with David. His dad moves out. He's out of the army three years. Now he's living in New York. He's all alone. He can't make friends. He can't even hold a job down. He's in this really little apartment. There's writing all over the wall because he's scribbling and everything. And he's shut himself in. He's put blankets over his window. No sunlight. Just completely in his mind. Yikes. He actually takes a month off from his job and... And no one calls, no one checks on him, nothing else. And he's just sitting there in his room by himself. No TV, like nothing. He's just, he's, he's in psychosis. Like an agoraphobia. Yeah, he's agor- but this, he's, he has a prolonged psychotic episode. Now he did know he was killing, but when you kill someone to silence the demons that we need to like think about, okay, where, where does the guilt lie here? You know what I'm saying? Which is re- why I really want to read this uh, book about him. Because once he did get help, and when he was in prison, he's like, I, you know, prison's fine, but I really wish someone would just help me. Someone help me. Like, mental health. Like, crying out. Like, mm. he finally did get the help he needed. I, I'm not sticking up for him by any means. He killed six people, and it was awful. But, you know what I'm saying? Anyway, moving on. Yeah. Now, let's talk about the first victims before the shootings. So David walks out with a, a large hunting knife and he's going to go stab a victim. Now, we don't know who the first victim was at all. It was a Hispanic lady from what he claims. We don't think or the detectives don't even think she was registered or whatever because she didn't even go to the hospital. She didn't die or anything. But basically, this is what happened. The demons were inside his head. They told him he has to sacrifice somebody and, quote, drink her blood. End quote. He goes up to a random woman who was walking in front of him with a big coat on because he's in New York and it's winter time, mm-hmm. and he just starts stabbing her in the back. However, she didn't even scream or anything because there was no, it didn't get through her coat. On David's third pass on the wide boulevard, he saw a woman leave the supermarket for the comparative darkness of the street. David could not see her features, but suddenly he heard the demon voice croaking, get her. She ends up getting stabbed, he claims, once in the eye. He hit her in the eye, and then she ran off. But there's no reports of who she was or whatever. So this may even be part of his, this may not even have happened. But the second stabbing we do know happened. Her name was Michelle Foreman. She was 15 years old. She was walking in the middle of a bridge, the, the throughway bridge. She had just came from her high school. Michelle first felt a stabbing pain in her head. The knife then struck her upper body three times. Blood spurted from her head. I never heard anyone scream like that, David said. The way she screamed constantly. I kept stabbing and nothing would happen. I just ran off. Yeah, so here's the thing about David Brickwood. As you're going to see with all the other victims, he actually prefers it if the... Lover's Lane car, they're making out if they're under a street light, which is unusual because, you know, you, you'd be able to see his face. But he likes to actually just see what's happening. It's like a movie for him. He, he wants likes to, to know that they're dead. Well, not even dead. that. It's like he he's really interesting. And he's it, like a voyeur. It's like he's interested hmm. in how it plays out like a movie. And he's always talking like, I was, why didn't she fall down quicker when I shot her in the head or stuff like that? Like he's critiquing it as he was um, 
a, a view, an active viewer instead of the the one oh, shooting okay. kind of thing. Not like not like interested in what they're doing in the car. Interested in the effect of his kill on the people. Yeah. Oh. So hmm. Michelle, this victim, she survives. He she noticed that he w- ran away with a sluggish gait, which we know he does have one. She stumbles towards the closest building, rings the buzzer. She was hospitalized for seven days, six stab wounds to her face and body. Mm. Okay, she suffered a collapsed lung but lived. Mm. God. Okay, so let's get on to the last fatality that we're going to talk about tonight, and then we'll cut it off. All right, this who you're looking at who you're looking at now is Donna Loria. She is the first murder, the actual one. We went to one of the last murders he did to start this episode, and the reason I like to do that is because you you see he shot him in the head directly point blank range and it was perfect uh, aim and everything else. Now we're actually going to the first actual shooting victim and you can see how he's progressing, what he's doing differently and everything else. Does Mm -hmm. that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So this is Donna Loria. She lives at two eight six zero Bure Avenue, dark hair, serious looking, uh, pretty girl. She, as a child, she was born deaf surgery and doctors actually helped her, you know, with however they did it, cured her wow. of her deafness. And that's possibly most likely why she wanted to become a medical technician when she grew up, which is what she was doing. She was actually working for the Empire State Ambulance Service as a medical technician. She was about to become a paramedic, but that's a lot of schooling to be a paramedic. So she was in the process of taking her last exam for paramedics uh, cert- cert- certification. Mm-hmm. So we're going to hit the Google Earth right quick. On Google Earth, for you YouTube guys, this is actually right in front of her apartment. Donna Loria, she lives at 2860 Bure Avenue in the Bronx. Now, this is the first one. This is before Son of Sam, before the 44 killer. This barely made the paper, even though it was tragic, but it was, you know, just a a crime, probably someone on drugs or something. So if you see this little black Honda... This is where her car was parked. Okay. Now, this is late at night, early morning. She is in the car with her bestie, and her name is Jody Valenti, J-O-D-I. Okay. And this is Jody, the blonde. Yeah. And the brunette. Okay. Now, real quick, tell me about the first victim, what hair color she was. Brunette. Brunette. Right. This is one of the things that... When the Son of Sam comes out and everyone's scared, people stop going places. However, especially this one right here where the blonde actually survives, Jody survives. She's the only one that survives this incident. It gives this false perception that blondes are safe because all the other murders are brunettes, right? Okay. So the very last murders that we're going to talk about, these the women, they thought they were safe because they were blonde. And in fact, when the women thought this, that it was only the brunettes that he was interested in, the beauty parlors made a killing because all these women would go, these brunettes, and get their hair dyed blonde. Now, mm. this was the panic that was going on. This okay. really happened. Like, everyone was blonde now. Wow. Because of this. Because they thought and that. And it wasn't the case at all. Interesting. You know, it was not the case. It's just like the, oh, he's only into killing women. This is not the case. He wasn't really looking for a specific type. He was just looking yeah, for situations. Like, yeah, he was an opportunist kind of killer. Yeah. But it just so happened that most of the victims were brunette. And then everyone went blonde. And then guess what? He kills a blonde. And everyone's like, shit, well, I guess that doesn't matter hmm. type of thing. July 29th, 1976, they're sitting in front of the apartment building right there. Donna was the passenger, okay? So David Burke was killed by going to the passenger window, right. not the driver's side. So Donna was the passenger. It is 1.10 a.m. July 29th. Donna, Donna Loria, was the passenger. This was down Bure Avenue right in front of her apartment. She was talking to her friend, Jody, and what happened was earlier, two days earlier, Donna's uncle died. So she went to the funeral parlor earlier this night, viewed the body, whatever. Then she wanted to blow off some steam. So she calls her best friend Jody. Now, this is before Son of Sam, before the panic. So the discos were full, filled up. But after, you know, all these murders, they're empty. 
So they go to the disco, they go to Manhattan or whatever. They come back. Her parents were actually out as well. Donna's parents. And they went to dinner or whatever. They actually get home around the same time, about 1 a.m. in the morning. Okay, 12, 30, 1 a.m. Donna pulls up and then the parents pull up right behind her. The dad comes over to Donna's car. Hey, you know, sweetie, you coming up, coming up to, to bed? Actually, they were... He, Actually, he was going to go up, get the dog. Then they were going to walk the dog together mm, Got it. at one in the morning, father and daughter. So right. so Donna's like, I'm just talking to my friend, Jody. Why don't you go get the pup and we'll walk him? Stuff like that. Five minutes. He goes upstairs. That's when David Berkowitz comes up. Donna's on the passenger side and she notices the guy come up. And then she looks at Jody and says, quote, who is this guy? What does he want? You know, he's literally looking in the window. He's the first time he's shooting in the window and the windows are up. He's looking in. He doesn't know what he's doing. So they're like, who is this guy? Creep looking in the window. Yeah, that's weird. He pulls out the pistol, the 44, this first time he's going to fire it and he shoots and he unloads the whole thing and Mm -hmm. it's sloppy. Half the bullets don't even hit the targets is his first one. And he doesn't know how powerful it is. And he just shoots as fast as he can. All five bullets. There's only five. So bow, 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 as fast as he can. Donna was the only one killed. She was hit in the right side of the neck. The mm-hmm. blood was spurting out and she died of the blood loss Oof. from being hit in the neck. So in the later murders, where does he hit? In the head, in the temple, right? Mm-hmm. So that's where he's hitting. She died within minutes. Jody was also hit. The, she was a driver, but she was hit in the thigh. She starts screaming and her head hits the horn which scares David Berkowitz off. He runs back to his car, which was a a yellowish Ford Galaxy, which I'll show you a picture of. David Berkowitz says the following, quote, I was heading west on Bureau Avenue, and I knew I had to get them. Those were my orders. I never saw them until moments before the shooting, end quote. He also, after the shooting, went to sleep, quote, fulfilled, end quote, that Hmm. night. Okay, because he there's silence in his head, right? right. The demons aren't clamoring so much. Huh. If you want to read this, I I clipped out some of the most the majority of the paper, but this is what I want you to read um, from this this from the Daily News about the the crime when she died. But and and you see, it's not a son of Sam, forty four caliber right. killer. They they, they don't didn't even know who it is. Not only that, but they didn't even know the caliber of the round because it's all destroyed and, and everything. They knew it was a big slug, but they thought it was a forty five. Hmm. Okay. So if you want to read this, this, is what the paper said about the killing. Chatting in a car, girl met by death. While the father was upstairs in the Laura Laura's fourth floor apartment, the gunman sneaked up on the girls and shot them. Miss Valenti got out of the car, went around to the other side, opened the door, and Miss Laria's body slumped onto the pavement. At this moment, the victim's father came out of the apartment house with the dog and burst into tears when he saw his daughter's body on the ground. Miss Valenti, a nurse who lives a few blocks away, told detectives that she did not recognize the killer. She said that he was a white man in his late 30s and wore a blue striped shirt so and that was it and there was no connection of 44 killer or anything until more murders Another victim, which we're going to yeah. talk about I, I do want to go into depth and all the killings so i'm, I'm gonna hope you guys are patient with me no i'm N- excited to cover this story. yeah next week not not in this episode but um now if you want to read this I never thought I killed her. I couldn't believe it. I just fired the gun, you know, at the car and the windshield. You just felt very good after you did it. It just happens to be satisfying to get the source of the blood. I felt that Sam was relieved. I came through. Okay, so what what do you guys think about everything we talked about? Uh, Andy, what what do you think his psychology is? Because we're going to go into a lot of it. He was was living... In hell, and we're going to talk about that in the next episode. But let me let me preface that by saying: so is Sam Satan? Like, <laughs> not Satan. No, this is not Satan. They're just satanic forces. Mm. In his mind. In his mind, yeah. So he's schizophrenic. Well, we'll talk about that later. But he claims this is crazy. The first murder, Donna Luria. David Berkowitz claims that the demons that demanded her to be killed, shot by him in the neck. The reason he did that is because they had promised him 
that Donna Loria, after she was dead, would be his as a bride. Uh, um. Okay, just just hold, just stay with me here. All right. Right after she died, his actual belief, like not, he's not just saying this to get out of being guilty. His actual, real, hallucinating belief in his. In his world, in his mind, was that af- immediately after the death, she would be wed to him. Okay? Promised by the demons. He says, quote, Sam lied to me. From now on, he would refer to her as in the letters, in multiple letters, as what? Remember I said, remember this is oh, a princess? Oh, yeah, yeah, the pretty princess. His quote, my little princess, end quote. He always talks about her. So go back to the letter. What did the letter say about the princess? And now she's sleeping in the, or let's go look at it real, real I quick. Remember. Quote, I miss my pretty princess most of all. She's resting in Our Lady's house, but I'll see her soon. I am the monster Be- Beelzebub, the chubby behemoth, end quote. So... That's out there, is it mm. not? Yeah, very. And it's a very sad story, especially the dad comes down five minutes oh, later with I the can't, dog. I can't even imagine. But we, yeah, we're going to get into more of this. Do you guys like this or not? Should yeah. I keep going with yeah. the the story? And because there's the the psychosis. Uh, I mean, we're talking about demon dogs. We're talking about uh, a bunch of different demons that he makes up. Um, I'm just going to kind of run real quick to, as a teaser. For instance, he says one of his neighbors that he's going to move into 35 Pine Street in Yonkers, where he's going to carry out his killings, you know, mm-hmm. go back to his apartment. He says one of his neighbors, they were really nice and quiet. However, they lied. This is a direct quote from him. A quote, they said they were good people and they were lying. I, th- I thought they were members of the human race. They weren't. Hmm. What? Suddenly they began showing up with demons. They begin to howl and cry. Okay, it's 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 pretty fucking deep. Really deep. It's it's really out there, some of the shit. And what was going on during this time, remember? Satanic panic mm. was going on this time. Yeah. I mean you had that church, I can't remember what it was called, that one or not church, it was a daycare. The daycare that was oh, in the yeah. was in the it was huge. The, the the kids the the media and this and I I know I talked about it with um that one guy but um you know the, this daycare during a satanic panic the the media was reporting that they were sacrificing goats mm. at the daycare. <laughs> they didn't oh even think God. to check if there were any goat carcasses anywhere. They said they sacrificed a kid. Who kid? What kid? No one claimed that their kids missing. You know, stuff like this. So I don't I don't know. Just I'm sorry. I know I'm going all over the place with this. But we're going to talk about the, quote, holiday in for demons, end quote. And we're going to talk about some of a lot of the demon dogs that continue to uh, hound him. Hmm. Anyway, I hope you guys like that. I know it was long. Thank you so much for sticking with me. I hope you guys don't mind if I expand on the story until next week. And sorry about last night and that we're not drinking now. We just got drunk and Need Just a break. Stupid. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, this is a talk more to me. We've been doing this for three years, 231 episodes. I don't know why we still do this section. <laughs> what the fuck? Because it's fun. Can't wait to learn more. I'm very intrigued by the attic thing. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Very yeah. We're going we're to go uh, all into that uh, and talk about all the other murders too that uh, he does. So anyway, that is the first two parts of David Berkowitz, Son of Sam. I hope you enjoyed it. My name is John. And until next time, good night, you lovely, lovely people.